All right, so Genesis chapter 30. You remember in chapter 29, we saw um, in this earlier, basically we had Jacob. He's gone to live with Laban. He's gone to find a wife. That's when he left um, Isaac and Rebekah to find a wife. So he goes unto, unto his uncle, unto Laban, and he's working there. And he, find, you know, he finds Rachel right away. He falls in love with her. And he decides, you know, he says, okay, I'll work seven years for Rachel, right, for your daughter. And, and they went by, it was, like, it was like nothing to him because of how much he loved Rachel. It just went by real fast. And then, of course, he was deceived. He was given Leah to wife instead of Rachel. And then, you know, he was all upset about that. So Laban's like, well, you know, I had to marry the firstborn first. And, you know, but here you can have Rachel also. So he says, okay, just work for me for another seven years. So now he's worked for, for 14 years for these two women. And obviously, like, that wasn't Jacob's plan was to have two wives. But he loved Rachel so much, and he was so upset because he'd been deceived that he didn't stick. And I preached all about the polygamy and all that other stuff, but we're going to see some more of the problems in this chapter as a result of that sin. And I believe it is a sin to get married to more than one wife. And yes, Jacob was deceived. Yes, there, you know, it, that wasn't right for that to happen to him, you know, like uh, uh, for Laban to do that to him. But he was also reaping what he'd sown because he had already deceived his father when receiving the blessing that Esau was supposed to get. So, you know, it kind of came back and bit him. But by go ahead and marrying a second wife, he shouldn't have been doing that either. And we're going to see some of this unfold in this chapter. But let's start looking at verse number one here, Genesis chapter 30. Verse number one says, And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children, or else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead, who hath withheld thee from the fruit of the womb? Now, that verse 2 is a great verse for showing people and illustrating that, you know, God is the one that opens up the womb. And I've preached this before, so I'm not going to go very in-depth on this, but a lot of people these days, you know, when they want to have children, they try to take things into their own hands way more often than they ought to. They think, you know, well, I just got married. We want to have kids, you know, and the wife's not having kids. You're thinking, well, what's the problem? You know, they might wait a year or two. And then before you know it, they're going off to the doctor and they're doing IVF and they're doing all this other wickedness. They're doing all this other stuff. And IVF, IVF is wickedness. And here's why it's wickedness is because in order for that, for that baby to be to be created in their lab dish, you know, they have to put a bunch of them together and knowing that a bunch of them are going to die. And what they're doing is they're just trying to find the strongest one and they basically throw out the rest. And they'll even put a bunch of them together and say, well, we'll see which one's going to be the strongest. And then invariably they end up killing, you know, after the, they've been conceived, Right? They call it another name. They'll call it a blastocyst. They call it fetus just to dehumanize it as a, an actual living baby. You know, we believe that, that life begins at conception. And Amen. when you do these, these weird, you know, you go to the doctor and you start doing all these things, you're, you're tinkering in things you ought not to be tinkering in. And it leads to sin and it leads to death. It leads to, to murder of a human life. And just no matter how little it is, it's still a human life. And when you go in there knowingly going around, just, just, you're like, well, we're just going to keep this one. Well, what happens to the other ones? They get killed. And um, look into it more for yourself and you'll see that what I'm saying is true. But like I said, I don't want to go too far into that today because the Bible says all throughout the Bible, there's many scriptures that, that will let us know, you know, God is the one who opens up and closes wombs. We saw already earlier in the book of Genesis when Abimelech was, was, you know, had taken Abraham's wife. Now, he didn't do anything with her, but, but you know, Abraham said, oh, you know, the, he's my, she's my sister. And Sarah said, oh, yeah, he's my brother. And Abimelech was, gonna, was, was thinking about marrying her and taking her unto himself. You know, God had, had appeared to him in a vision and told him to stay away from her. Don't touch her. That's, you know, that's another man's wife, basically. And it also says that he had shut up the wombs of the women of that city. So God had made it so that nobody was getting pregnant. Because the Bible says that children are an heritage to the Lord. The Bible says that children are a blessing. 
All throughout the Bible, children are a blessing. And again, we live in a warped, backward society that will tell you, oh, children are a burden. You should limit how many kids you have. And you should only have like one or two kids. And you got to send them off to college. You got to do all these other things. And it's man's wisdom. And it's not God's wisdom. God says, you know, basically, the more kids you have, the merrier. The Bible says, happy is the man, you know, happy is the man to have his quiver full of them. Talking about children. They're a good thing. They're a blessing. And here we see Rachel getting angry, right? First, she's envious of her sister because Leah's, God's opened up Leah's womb. And one of the reasons being is that Leah was hated. That's, why, you know, that's kind of why I went into that intro of, of Jacob in his, in his situation where he married Leach, Leah, but he really wanted to marry Rachel, and then he's ended up married to both of them. Well, he loved Rachel. He never, never says that he like loved Leah or wanted to be married her to her or anything. He kind of got suckered into that. So he's, he's married to this woman. Now, think about the situation she's in. She's married to a guy that really didn't want to be married to her. And he loves her sister more than her. Right? So she, you know, her sister's the favored one. And God sees this and God says, okay, well, I'm going to open up Leah's womb. Right? And Leah's thinking, great, you know, I'm having these sons. Maybe my, and, and, and every time she's bearing sons, she's like, maybe my husband now is going to love me. Maybe now my husband is going to stay with me. You know, maybe now I'm going to win his affection over because I'm having these children, because I'm having these sons. Well, and then you have now Rachel seeing, hey, Leah's having these children. I want children, right? And she goes up to even to, to Jacob saying, look, you know, give me children or else I'm going to die here. And Jacob gets angry. He's like, well, what, do you think I'm God? Do you think I can control whether or not you have children? He's like, God's the only one that can do that. God's the one that withholds the fruit of the womb. He's like, that's not me. But I want to point out in verse 1 that it says that Rachel envied her sister. I want to go a little bit into envy tonight and how wicked that is because we see a lot of problems. Envy always causes strife. So first, let's start off and just kind of explaining what envy is. Because envy can be confused with a few things these days. One, one common misconception of envy is jealousy. Right? So when, what people will oftentimes think today that if you're envious of someone, you're jealous of them. And they'll use that word jealous. But in Scripture, the Bible definition of jealous, it's not a bad thing at all. And it's not the same thing as envious. The Bible talks about God being jealous, about having a godly jealousy about God. And here's, here's the context of, in one of the ways that God is jealous over us. He doesn't want us serving any other gods. He doesn't want us worshiping any other gods. He gets jealous. He wants all of our attention and devotion. If it's going to any God, he wants it all going to him. He doesn't want our time split up between him and you know, the sun God and the moon God and all these other gods, right? these false gods. He says, no, I'm a jealous God. I want all of your attention. That's the same way with you know, men and women and husbands and wives. You say, are you a jealous husband? Yes, I am a jealous husband. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I don't care what this world is going to try to tell you. And guess what? My wife is a jealous wife. Because what that means is, I don't want my wife spending a bunch of her time with other guys and befriending them and getting, having close relationships with another guy. Because I am her guy friend. We are married. She's not going to be having any type of relationship like that with another man because I'm jealous because I want her attention for myself in the same way that she doesn't want me making friends, making friends with these girls at the job, making friends with girls somewhere else and going out to lunch and doing all that. Look, no, she is my girlfriend. I don't need to have any other girlfriends because She's mine. We've committed to each other. We don't need any type of relationship like that outside of our marriage. And we're jealous over each other. And I believe it's a godly jealousy. And that's something, that's an attribute that God himself even has. So good luck trying to explain to me that that's a negative thing or a bad thing. No, it's a very good thing. For one, it shows how much you love each other. But this world today will try, oh, you're just insecure. Oh, what, you don't trust your wife? No, look, I do trust my wife, and I am secure. I have no problems. I don't, I don't doubt my wife's fidelity for a moment. But I still want all of her attention. And just because I trust my wife, it doesn't mean I trust some other guy either. 
You know, I'll trust my wife. I don't trust another man. A lot of things happen when, when people get themselves in situations, especially women. You know, and, and I'm going to be smart about that so, that so that there's no chance for any infidelity to happen, even if it's brought on something and she doesn't even want it, you know, whatever, because I trust her. But, you know, people try to say, oh, yeah, you just, you just are insecure. No. It's a godly attribute to be jealous over your wife. That's not what envy is. Okay, so envy is different. Envy is something where it's, it's like covetousness, right? When you're envious over someone, you're, you're desiring something that they have or wanting to be like them or wanting something else that you don't have, right? You're wanting something you don't have. In this case, Rachel was wanting to have children and she wasn't having them and she saw that her sister does have them. So she's looking on someone else's life with envy, right? And people do that all the time today. They'll look at someone, for example, they'll look at someone who has a lot of money, Right? And they'll say, oh man, how nice that must be. Oh, I wish I was in their shoes and I had all this money and I had all that. Look, that's envious. You're being envious and that's wrong and that's a sin. And we're going to look at some scripture about that. You can keep your finger here in Genesis 30. We're going to go through the whole chapter. But turn, if you would, first of all, to uh, Titus chapter 3 in the New Testament. Because we're going to see envious, envy in the Bible is always tied up with strife and problems and fightings and um, maliciousness, hatefulness is all tied up and associated with envy. And when you start looking at other people's stuff and wishing you were like them, you know, and it doesn't have to just be money. You know, it could be someone saying, oh, wow, I wish I had a godly husband. You know, like ladies saying, you know, well, this man, oh, he's, he's a great godly husband. He's, he's a great example of someone that's doing so. You know, I wish my husband could be more like him and be, start to become envious of another woman over her husband or, or vice versa. Right? A man being envious over someone else's wife and say, oh, she's so great. She always listens. She always does this. She does that. You know, and she's, she's such a great person. You start to become envious of that person. That's wickedness. That's a sin. And that's also covetousness, too, when you start coveting something that you don't have. Titus chapter 3, look at verse number 3 of Titus 3. The Bible reads, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So just look at the context here of, of envy, what that's, what's wrapped up with envy. Say, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, malice, living in malice is like hatred. You, you, you have this, this malice towards people, there's a hatred towards people and envy. And then it says hateful and hating one another. There's a lot of hatred involved with envy. And that's why there's also a lot of strife and fighting. And we see here, you know, we'll, as we get into the chapter a little bit further too, I want you to remember the envy that Rachel has because it turns into this fighting and hatred between these sisters. And this will tell you, you know, this shows you how screwed up that situation got with a polygamous relationship. Now, instead of sisters who are supposed to love each other and be there for each other and have a great relationship together, now because they're both married to the same man, they're turned against each other. They're fighting. They're envious. And they have nothing but competition going on between them all the time. And we're going to see that as we go through it. We already read the chapter in full, but you're going to start to see it. We'll point it out as we go through it. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter uh, 13. Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 13. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. We're seeing another reference for envy. We already saw in, in Titus 3 that it's, it's tied up with malice, hate, and envy. All go together. Acts 13, verse 45. Acts 13, verse 45 reads, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So they're starting to, to fight and to contradict and, and to blaspheme. Why? Is it because they were interested in the truth and they thought Paul was wrong? No. It's because they were envious, because they saw what Paul was doing. They saw people were believing and listening and getting saved and hearing God's word and learning the truth, and they were envious at that. 
these false prophets wanted people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they wanted people following them. And that's what they were starting to get envious of Jesus Christ when he was having, you know, when he was starting to get people gathered and people were listening to him and people were following him. They never got crowds like that. And people dedicated to serving him. And people who were zealous and, and wanting to do good things and wanting to follow Christ, they could see that because that was genuine, that was real. As opposed to their lies and their hypocrisy that, yeah, they can, they can pull the wool over a bunch of people's eyes, but they don't have these zealous followers, right? They were jealous about that. Flip back to chapter 7 of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7. So when those Jews were filled with envy, what did they do? They spake, They were fighting against Paul. They were speaking against the, the truth. They were contradicting and they were blaspheming. The book of Acts chapter 7 verse 9, it's talking about um, the children of Israel. The literal children of Israel. Jacob, his, his, his sons. It says, And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with them. So, why did, why did Joseph get, get, you know, they wanted to kill him, first of all. But when they decided not to kill him, they sold him into, into slavery. And why did they do it? The Bible says right here, out of envy. Why? Because Joseph was his dad's favorite, right? Jacob loved Joseph. He was, you know, he was Rachel's son, but he loved him. And he, gave, he made him that coat of many colors and stuff. And, and he was always, do, you know, he was doing a lot of the right thing. He was listening to his dad. And he was always the one being sent to check up on his brothers, make sure where they're at, make sure they're not getting into trouble. And they hated him because they envied him. And then you remember he was having these dreams, these visions, and just saying, you know, like, you know, that basically he was going to be exalted and all of his brethren and even his mother and his father were going to be doing obeisance to him which ended up coming true because it was a vision from God, but they envied that. They, that, that. That made them angry and hateful against him because they envied him and they sold him into slavery. That's the result of their envy. And then um, flip back, if you would, to Genesis 30. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 4 says, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? So again, we see wrath and anger all being associated with envy. Envy is, is, is only going to cause fighting and problems. So when you, start to, when you start to think this way, when you start to look at something else, just remember that, look, that's not good for your heart. That's not good for anything. It's a sin to become envious and to start wanting what you don't have, especially things that other people have and become envious of them. You're going to end up hating them. It's interesting how it's weird how that works sometimes. But that's what happens. And you have someone like Rachel who should be loving her sister, but when she becomes envious of her sister, she's going to end up hating her sister. Because she wants what she has and she doesn't have it. And, and it's this, this wicked desire that, that, that leads to more fighting and more problems. And we're going to see some of these problems now. And, and because of this envy, look at what happens in verse number 3 of Genesis 30. So Rachel wants to have kids so bad, she's envious of her sister, and she's like, I'm going to die if you don't give me children. So here's what her plan is. Here's what her wicked invention is in verse number 3. And she said, Behold my maid Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees that I may also have children by her. So now her plan is, well, if I can't have children, this is my maid, this is my servant, right? I'm going to give her unto you now, and you're going to have a relation with her. She's going to become your wife, but just for the purpose of having a child so that she could be have my child. This is wickedness. It's, it's a, she's like, basically, she wants her to be the surrogate mother, right? She's like, I want to have a child so bad, I don't care if you have it with another woman, and then it becomes my child. Which, again, only leads to even more problems. So here we have Jacob. He's got enough problems as it is with two wives. And what happens? He adds unto him a third wife with the handmaid. Look at verse 4. And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid, to wife. And Jacob went in unto her. Now, her envy is what led her to come up with this wicked plan. 
But what in the world was Jacob thinking, listening to her, hearkening unto her, and listening to what she had to say? Now, that was wrong on both of their counts. She came up with a bad plan, just like Sarah and Abraham. Sarah came up with the same exact plan with Hagar. And that's where Ishmael came from. But again, and Abraham listened to her. Look, guys, if your wife comes to you and says, it's okay, it's fine, I want you to sleep with this woman. Don't fall for it. Don't think that this is some good thing. Hey, great, yeah, my wife wants me to, you know, no. No, that's wrong. It's wickedness. And you know what? No man should want, should want that. You know, men these days, you can, you, you can make a joke about, oh, yeah, huh, you know, men are, are these pigs and they just want to be, you know, having these relations with all, with all kinds of women and stuff. But no, men, you shouldn't be like that. And a godly man isn't like that. You're going to only want your wife. And that's who you should only want. And even if a situation like this, you get, the, you know, and they'll try to spin and say, oh, no, I'm doing this for my wife because she really wants to have a child. Look. You pray to God for that. He, he already knows that God's the one that opens and closes the womb. That's what his response was to Rachel. So what is he doing? Taking on another wife. Taking on that handmaid. He knows God's the one that's going to have to open up her womb. But it's wickedness. So she gives it. He, he hearkens unto her. Now, this reminds, this reminds me a lot of Adam. You flip back to chapter 3. We'll see uh, uh, how Adam hearkened unto Eve. Because if you remember, Eve was the one that was deceived in the garden, not Adam. Adam wasn't tricked. When the serpent came into the garden and deceived someone, he deceived Eve. Satan deceived Eve with the fruit. She was tricked by him, and he was the one, you know, twisting scripture and everything. Oh, did God really say that? And saying, well, no, really, you know, you're going to be like a God, and you're going to know all this stuff, and it's, you know, it's really good for you. So he tricked her into eating it. But then she came and brought the fruit unto her husband, unto Adam, after she was tricked and after she was eaten of it, and then he consciously chose to eat of the fruit himself. But he would, the Bible says that he was not deceived but that the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, he had his own sin because he listened unto her. He's like, hey, why don't you know, eat this? And he's like, okay. And he listens unto his wife. So look at Genesis 3, verse 27, or 17, excuse me, verse 17. The Bible says, And unto Adam he said, this is God speaking, Unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So he receives a cursing. He says, why? Because he listened unto his wife in this matter. Now, as the husband, as the man, you are in the leadership role in your family. There are going to be times when you're going to have to tell your wife, no, in order to do your job appropriately. Now, is that every time? Are you just the no man? No, I mean, my wife might think sometimes I'm the no man. It's because that's when it comes to money. I'm always just like, no, 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 no. Can't afford it. Nope, nope, nope. Can't do it. But seriously, though, you have the responsibility. You are supposed to be the spiritual head of your household as well as just the, the, figure, the, the head of the household and making the final decisions on things and, and running and ruling your house well. And in order to do that, you need to make sure that you are not going to succumb to sin and to succumb to these sinful um, offers or whatever, you know, th these things that come up. Like with Adam, you know, his wife came up to him and said, here, why, why don't you eat this? Right? And, and he does. Or with Jacob saying, hey, I want to have a child. I think you should do this. Look, as the, as the man, you know, you're, you're the wife, Rachel, in this situation, She's really upset because she's envious. She's already in sin and she's trying to add on to that. You need to be able to have the clear head and, and to be able to rule well enough to say, no, that's a bad idea. We're not doing this. That's just adding more sin upon sin. We just need to pray unto God. That's what Jacob should have done. That's what Adam should have done. And that's what you need to do because you are that head of the household. You need to be able to be wise and smart concerning these things and not be 
again, not be suckered into it, into, into doing more sin, thinking, well, my wife's already doing it. Because again, that's going to be a, a more of a, a temptation as well. And it's not just like that with husband's wife. Just sin in general. When you're around other people doing a certain sin, somehow it becomes a little bit more acceptable because you're thinking, well, they can't look bad on me for this because they're already doing it. Right? My wife can't look bad on me for this sin because she's already she's suggesting it to me. Right? So in your mind, you're already thinking, well, it's, it's not, I'm not going to look that bad. Right? But you're thinking about it wrong because you're thinking about it in terms of between them and not in God's eyes. Right? God's the one who we need to be concerned with how are we viewed in His eyes. Not just the people around us. I mean, if, if, if everybody in this room was just saying, hey, you know, if everybody else decided except for me were saying, you know what, we're all going to go down to the bar and get a drink. It's a lot more likely for the one person to just join in, to join in the crowd, to just, just, just to go with the group and do it because everybody else is doing it and you kind of lessen the severity of that sin. You kind of think like, well, it's not as big of a deal. Well, everyone's doing it anyways. But that's the wrong thing to do. And you, and you could be thinking like, well, if I were to do this, I mean, what are they going to say to me? Right? They can't judge me because they're doing it. Right? They'd be hypocrites then. But guess what? God's watching what you do. And just because everyone else is doing something wrong doesn't make it okay for you to do it. You need to stand firm. You need to be able to say, no, this is right and this is wrong and we're going to do what's right. And that's what Jacob should have been able to do. Just like that. We need to be able to look, look at these examples. These, these, you know, this chapter isn't here for no reason. We need to be able to learn from this. Learn from other people's mistakes. Don't make the mistakes yourself. Now, I don't think anybody's going to be worried about having a, to, to get another wife anytime soon. Because, just because I mean, it's not even a part of our culture. It's not something that people really do unless you're a fundamental Mormon and you, you know, you're living in Utah. But, or in the, that whatever that, that Arizona town was too that had that, that one guy that was arrested and stuff. But, but you know what I'm saying. It doesn't have to be polygamy. It could be anything. It could be any sin. Any sin that someone brings up, even if it's your own wife. Right? Saying, hey, let's, let's rent this wicked movie. Let's whatever. You know, you need to be able to, to even if it's something that might appeal to you or whatever, to say resist that own temptation and do what's right and say, no, we're going to do what's right and we're going to obey God. Well, let's keep going. I, I, I don't understand how Jacob fell for this. Look at... Um, so, verse 5, it says, And Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son. Therefore she ca called she his name Dan. Now, people do this all the time, too. They misjudge their own sinful actions and, and what happens around them and think that, oh, God must be okay with this and God has condoned this because she ended up having a child. Right? They're saying, well, God must be blessing this because here's a child. No. Look, sometimes these things happen and it's not God putting his stamp of approval on it. And people will look at certain situations in their life and just because, maybe, you know, Maybe, here's a great example. Someone goes in the casino, right? And they sit down at the table and they start gambling and they walk away and they, and they win, you know, they pull those slots and they win all kinds of money. Well, God must, have, must be blessing me and, is, and is really just loves me doing this and, and that's why he gave, you know, he's okay with gambling. He's okay with this. This is fine. No. He's not. Gambling is a sin. And that's a whole other sermon. Actually, I should preach that soon because I don't think I've preached one on gambling since we've been here. But, um, or another example. I mean, you could say, well, you know, I went into this bar and I got really drunk and then I met this girl and then she ended up becoming my wife. And, well, God must have blessed me doing You know, it's like, no, your drunkenness was a sin. You can't judge everything that happens and say and justify a sin as, a, as say that must be, that must have been okay. Because if I wasn't there and getting drunk, then I wouldn't have met her you know, and all this other stuff. Right? People, people go on and on with these different explanations. And this is what, what Rachel does here. She's thinking, wow, well, God's really blessed. God, listen to my prayer. No. There was still a sin to give your handmaid unto your husband. That's still wrong. That's still against God's word. Because here's the thing. 
God's Word says what it says. Regardless of what your outcome is and what you think the, the outcome is, if it's good for you, God's Word is God's Word. And I already covered the polygamy. We're not going into that tonight. But we saw in multiple places that God is never designed for man to have more than one wife. And He's made, you know, portions of the law that pertain to that event happening, but it wasn't a, a condoning of polygamy. But let's look a little bit now of how this, you know, what, what's happening with these sisters, because we're going to see a little bit more of that. Verse number 7, And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, With great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali. Look at the heart, look at the spirit between her and her sister with Rachel, because she had this envy, and she's like, We're fighting, we're wrestling, and I'm prevailing. Right? Because now my handmaid had two sons from my husband. She's upset because her, si because her husband's married to her sister and having children, yet somehow she's, she's happy that her husband's married to another woman and having children with her. The whole thing does, is screwy. It doesn't make any sense. But this is, I mean, when people get wrapped up, especially in this envy, it's confusion because what's more confusing than that? I mean, this guy is going to end up having four wives and all these different kids with these different wives and all these fightings and troubles and turmoil. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 9. When Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her Jacob to wife. So now Leah's getting involved. She's saying, well, I stopped having kids. And... Rachel did this. She gave her a handmaid. So well, I have a handmaid too. Well, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to one-up Rachel. And my handmaid now is going to bear children for me. You see, I mean, you see how it's just this back and forth thing? Look, Leah shouldn't have done it either. That's, that's wickedness for her. She, but now she's getting involved. And you see how this thing's just getting out of control. And it started off just with the two wives, right? And it should have just been one. The damage should have been cut when Jacob was tricked, but you know what? He's consummated the marriage, and now he's married to Leah, and that should have been that. And he, would have, he should have just made the best of his situation and continued on with Leah and had her as his wife, and, and you know that would have been the right thing to do. But instead, he takes a second wife, and now all of a sudden, he has four and all a whole bunch of problems. And people say, you know, I've heard, you know, guys will say, oh man, I wish I could have four wives, you know, like thinking how great that would be. You think this looks like a great, healthy life that you would want to be a part of where you've got these multiple wives and they're all fighting with each other and it continues though. I mean, it's, it's, this is not, this is not a pleasant experience for Jake. I guarantee you that. So Leah does this, right? Verse 10, And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son. And Leah said, A troop cometh. And she called his name Gad. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. And Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them unto his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. And she said unto her, Is it a small matter that thou hast taken my husband? And wouldest thou take away my son's mandrakes also? And here we see a little bit about how Leah's free. I mean, she's, she's just feeling like, You've taken my husband away. And this is after how many, I mean, this is years and years and years later. Because he's having kids with all these different women. And she's still just like, feels like Rachel has taken her husband away because she was married to him first, even though he loved her. And I'm sure, you know, her saying that you've taken my husband away, he's probably spending a lot more time with Rachel because she was the one that he loved to begin with, right? And he got tricked in his marriage, but he's, he's still probably spending a lot more time with Rachel. And Leah feels hurt and feels kind of abandoned. And, you know, again, with all these children that she's had, she, she kept on saying, man, you know, great. Now my husband's going to love me. Now my husband, now he's going to really want to be with me because I'm giving him all these children. That was her attitude in the last chapter. We saw that when we read ver, uh, chapter 29. But we see this bitterness 
in this strife, fighting, wrath, envy, hatefulness. And she's saying, what, you, you, you're taking my husband, now you want to take my mandrake? And I don't know what a mandrake is, to be honest with you, but whatever it is, they're in high demand because you know, they, really want, they really want these mandrakes. You know, Reuben finds them out in the field, he brings them home, mom, look, I got some mandrakes. And then Rachel finds out about them, she's like, hey, can I have some of those mandrakes? So here's what they do, they barter. They barter for these mandrakes. It says, um, finishing verse 15, and Rachel said, Therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrake. So they're, now they're, they're, they're bartering over Jacob. Like, well, who's he going to go home with tonight? And he's going to go home with you, right? And, it, and it, this is what they're doing. And, and she even says that. It says in verse 16, And Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him and said, Thou must come in unto me. For surely I have hired thee with my son's mandrake. She's his wife. And she's saying, I've hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. <laughs> Completely dysfunctional family. Okay, this is not the way that God has designed it at all. And we just see nothing but problems as a result. Verse 17, And God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bear Jacob the fifth son. Now, here we see the actual scriptural evidence of God listening. You know, before we saw Rachel saying, Oh, God, listen to my prayer. And we saw Leah say, Oh, God's blessing me now because I've given him my handmaid. Look, that was them speaking. But here the narrator saying, God listened to their prayer and gave them children the right way, you know, like, like with their husband, not with these handmaids and stuff. These are the prayers that God's answering are the ones that, that they are making for their own children, not to have with some other woman, not to have in some sinful relationship, but for them personally to have with their husband. That's the, the prayer that God is listening to and He is answering. And I think it's interesting that, because He does this with Leah and then He'll end up doing it with Rachel also. He, he answers their prayers. And what's important to remember about that, just with prayer in general, all the more reason to make sure that you're praying is as a regular part of your life. It should be something you're doing. You know, the Bible says pray without ceasing. The Bible says we need to be praying a lot. You know, we need to be going to God with all of our cares and all of our concerns. We should be praying at least every day, but I, I say multiple times throughout the day. And that's why I always make it a habit to pray before I eat a meal. Now, is that required to do? And if I don't do it, I'm in sin? No. I don't believe that. But the Bible says in, in, in everything, you know, give thanks. So I eat my food with thanksgiving as part of that prayer, but that's not really a prayer. Giving thanks unto God isn't a prayer. It's just giving thanks. You're just telling Him thanks. Praying is when you ask for something. That's what the word to pray literally means, is to ask. And even when you do wrong, even when you sin, even when you make poor choices, God will, can still hear your prayers. And He did with Lee and Rachel. Now, they made some bad decisions and some bad mistakes, and they were foolish, and they got into a in sinful situation here of offering up their maids. But God still listened to their prayers, even after that. And keep that in mind. Now, it doesn't mean just, oh, just go off and keep sinning and then just keep praying to God and expect to have everything. No, but... But don't let it get you down when you do sin, when you do do wrong, so that you stop praying to God, thinking, well, God's not going to listen to me anyways. No. Always go to God with your, with your concerns and with your prayers and with things like that. Always go to God. Because God does listen to prayer. He does answer prayers because God loves you as His child if you're born again. If you're a child of God, He loves you as His son or His daughter. And He will listen and answer your prayers. And even with Leah and Rachel, even when they're doing these things they shouldn't have been doing, he still listened to them. I mean, the Bible says that. God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. Verse 18, And Leah said, God hath given me my hire because I have given... And see, this is, this is the way she interprets this. And her interpretation is wrong. She says, God hath given me my hire because I have given my maiden to my husband. Is that why? No. It's because you were praying for a son. It's not because you've given your husband another wife. But this is the way she perceives it. And she called his name Issachar. And again, just one side note for when you read the Bible, just because characters in the Bible do things or say things 
just because it's in the Bible doesn't make it right or good because they did them. You have to, we have to, first of all, when you take, when you're going to find truth in the Bible, the narrator of the Bible, like the Holy Spirit that says something, like in verse 17, this wasn't Leah speaking, this wasn't Jacob speaking, this wasn't any human being speaking, it just says the narrator is saying, and God hearkened unto Leah, right? That is a fact, that is true, and that is good and right, because it's coming from the narrator. It's, a, it's not just a matter of what someone said. Now, these things that these people said, that is exactly what they said because it's in the Bible, because that is true that they said them. But what they said isn't always right. For example, we have a recording of things that Satan says. But just because Satan says it, does that mean it's right? Even if it's in the Bible, does that mean it's right? No. But it is what he said, and it's recorded in the Bible. So these things that Leah said, they're recorded. They're in here. I mean, a perfect example of this is in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, we see when Jesus was, had gotten away from his family and he was you know, talking, with the, talking with the doctors and the lawyers and everything else, and Joseph and Mary and his family, they were all kind of going back home and they realized, hey, wait, where's Jesus? Right? So they go back to Jerusalem and they find him in the temple and he's, you know, he's talking to these doctors and lawyers. And Mary says to Jesus, you know, Basically, you know, where have you been? My, don't you know that, that thy, fa you know, thy father and I have sought thee? And she called Joseph Jesus' father. But Joseph isn't Jesus' father. God is Jesus' father, right? He's his stepdad, right, technically, but, but he's not his father. So Jesus responds to her and says, What? Know ye not that I must be about my father's business? He corrects her. In his response, he's saying, wait a minute, you know, you said my father, you know, you and my father have been searching for me, but I'm doing my father's business. Not Joseph's business. He's doing God's business because that's his father and he corrects her. But is it true that Mary said those things? Yes. And I've had people try to come to me, you know, they're trying to show problems with the King James Bible and say, see right here, it calls Joseph Jesus' father. No, Mary called Joseph Jesus' father. The Bible didn't, but Mary's words did. So when you see the narrator of the Bible saying something, the narrator of the Bible never calls Joseph Jesus' father. But people can, and, and what the Bible records is what they say and what they think sometimes, but it doesn't mean it's always right. It doesn't mean it's always wrong, but you can't just look at something they said. And the book of Job is full of people saying the wrong thing. To read the book of Job and be careful of anyone who wants to pull out scripture from Job as being truth. If it's something that Job says, fine. If it's something that God says, fine. But when you start looking at Bildad and, and all these other guys, you know, these Eliphaz, these, these friends of Job, you read through that whole book and there's chapters where they're speaking. At the very end, God says, the things that your friends said are wrong. They're not true. Job, you need to pray for your friends. Because they were saying that Job was in all the sin. They were saying it's all your own fault. You know, where's your secret sins? What are you doing, Job? Come on. You know, if God's, God's not unrighteous. And they, and they just give him this hard time and berate him. And they were wrong. And you can see false doctrine in what they believed. So just because it's there and it's written doesn't make it right. So just, just remember that. I mean, it's just something to keep in mind as you're studying, as you're reading your Bible. Again, I mean, we could see the same thing with Leah. She's thinking that God's blessing her with a child because she gave her handmaid to Jacob to be his fourth wife. And that's just simply not true. She was wrong. She was mistaken. She, she, she was incorrect in her analysis of the situation. But that is what she thought, and that is what she said. So it says um, in verse 20, and, and Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she's still worried about her husband dwelling with her, staying with her after six children. Obviously, this was her big concern. And Rachel's concern was even having children. Verse 21, And afterward she bare a daughter and called her name Dinah. And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. So here we see God, again, answering prayers, answering Rachel. Finally he answers, and he opens her womb. Which means that he had her womb closed. 
Now, we know that she was having a relationship with Jacob. We know that they were doing what married people do, and probably way more often than, than, than with Leah, because Leah didn't, like, she, she just continues, like, he's not staying with me, he doesn't love me, all this other stuff. Yet, because God is the one that opens and closes the womb, she wasn't having children. But then he finally remembers her, he hearkens unto her, and he opens her womb. And here's the thing. Let's let God decide what's right for us as far as how many children to have. We don't need to be taking that in matters into our own hands and, and saying, well, now we're not going to have any, and now we are, and now we're not, and everything else, and just, just make your own plan. Let God decide what's right for you. For Abraham, he decided one child was enough for him. For Isaac, it was two. He had Jacob and Esau, and that's it. But for other people, you look at He-Man in the Bible, he had 27 or 3, I forget the actual number. He had 20-something. I mean, he had, he had a, lot of, a lot of kids, okay? But to some, God gives many children. To some, he doesn't. But let God be the one that opens up the womb. And there's people today, I mean, it's the same thing. Some people have a lot of children, some people don't. But if you don't have a lot of children, don't become envious of people that do if you want to have more children. Don't become envious because that's going to cause more hateful, hatefulness and bitterness and, and strife that you don't need. And if you have a lot, then rejoice and just be glad. Right? Be glad. But the, the bottom line is be content with the things that you have. Just be happy with the blessing that God has given you. If you don't have any children, be happy that God's given you a wife. If you have a wife, if you don't have a wife, pray to God to give you a godly wife. You know, thank God for your salvation. Thank God for anything that you have and everything that you have. And don't look on other people's stuff and on other people's kids and other people's lives and become envious of them. That's going to lead to hatred and just, just bizarre, wicked inventions. So let's keep going here. We're almost done. Let's read through um, chapter, or I mean, verse number 23. And she conceived and bare a son. And God said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. And she did get another son. That's Benjamin, but that's not till much later. Uh, verse 25. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said unto Laban, Send me away that I may go unto mine own place and to my own country. So now. Jacob's ready to go, right? He's been there for a long time. He's, he's put in his time. He's put in his 14 years for his wives by this point. And he's ready to go. So he says in verse 26, Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee, and let me go, for thou knowest my service which I have done thee. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. And he said, appoint me thy wages and I will give it. So Laban's looking at him and saying, look, I don't want him to go because he knows that God is blessing Laban and, and you know, his herds are multiplying and he's really increasing because of Jacob, because Jacob's there. And, you know, this also speaks to what a hard worker Jacob was too because Laban doesn't want him to go. And he says this, and this is something that we all probably wish our bosses would say to us, you know, appoint me thy wages and I will give it. He was able to name his price just to continue working for, for Laban. Laban's like, look, you are very valuable. God is blessed. I want you to stay. Name your price. What, what can I pay you? to get you to keep working for me. And, you know, a lesson we can learn from this, hey, if you work hard and you're not uh, someone who works as a, as a man pleaser, right, to be seen of men, where you know the guy who, you know, is lazy, slacks around, doesn't do his work, but then when the boss is walking by, it's, oh, I gotta, you gotta make sure I'm, I'm looking busy at that moment. And then the whole rest of the time, you're not, you're not doing anything. You're not being productive, right? That's someone with, with eye service as a men pleaser, as the Bible puts it, that we need to work whatever job you're in as if you're working for God, as if your boss is the Lord. That's the way that you ought to be. And if you work with that type of an attitude, 
many times, you know, your employer will see what a good worker, hard worker you are and want to promote you and want you doing more important tasks and you'll end up earning more money as a result. But even if that doesn't happen, God says that he'll reward you. God sees the injustices that go on. God sees if you're getting, you know, persecuted. If you're not receiving a just recompense of your own reward, God says, you know what? Don't worry about that because I'll take care of it. And I'll tell you what, I'd, I'd, I'd rather have God right some wrongs for you know like like i'd much rather than 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 actually receiving you know all the money or finances or whatever that 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 i could receive by working really hard at a job i think i'd rather receive less money and have god just recompense me for it and say you know what i've seen the work that you've done i've seen that your boss isn't paying you appropriately i can see everything that's going on and i'm going to reward you for it and and god promises to do that God, will, God sees, he looks out for the fatherless and the widows and he looks out for those that are persecuted under oppression and he will right the wrongs. So for us, you know, because a lot of people get this mindset of saying, well, he's only paying me this much, so that's all he's going to get out of me. You know, he's going to pay me, you know, minimum wage and I'm going to give him minimum work. And this is the attitude mindset that people have, but I'll tell you what, it's only going to hurt you in the long run having that type of a bad, poor attitude because you'll never advance then. The boss is going to see, oh, okay, yeah. Here's someone doing the minimum, but then here's somebody who's really excelling and doing more than I asked them to do. Who do you think is going to get the race? Or who do you think he's going to hold on to when the layoffs come? Or who do you, you know, it doesn't take that much knowledge to understand. It's not much wisdom. Later, Jacob was a hard worker and he was so hard of a worker and did such a good job that Laban was able to say, name your price. Name your price. So verse 29 says, And he said unto him, Thou knowest how I have served thee and how thy cattle was with me. For it was little which thou hadst before I came and it is now increased unto a multitude. Now, here's some good advice too if you ever need to approach your boss for a raise. Bring up all the good things that you've done, right? <laughs> He's saying, you know your flocks. You know how your cattle, it, it was little. Like you didn't have very much before I came. But now after I hear I've done this, you know, it's increased this much, right? Because he's about to tell him what he wants for his service, what he wants for his wage. He says, and now is increased unto a multitude. And the Lord hath blessed thee since my coming. And now when shall I provide for my own house also? He's saying, look, I've been providing all of this for you. I've been making all this wealth for you. But now I, I need to be able to provide for my own house also. That's why he wants to be sent out so he can just, you know, so he can work and provide for his own family. Verse 31, and he said, what shall I give thee? And I like this. It says, and Jacob said, thou shalt not give me anything. So Laban's like, well, what, what do you want me to give you? As if, He's doing him a favor. Well, what can I give for you, right? And Jacob's like, I don't want you to give me anything. I'm going to work for it and I'm going to earn it, right? And this is what it's going to be. I don't need your handout. This is what you're going to pay me. He says, thou shalt not give me anything. If thou wilt do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep thy flock. And now he names, he says, I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the brown cattle among the sheep and the spotted and speckled among the goats and of such shall be my hire. So shall my righteousness answer for me in the time to come when it shall come for my hire before thy face. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep that shall be counted stolen with me. And Laban said, Behold, I would it might be according to thy word. So Laban's agreeable unto this. And basically what he's saying is, look, all the, the spotted and ring straked and brown, you know, like, like all that's not the best, right? You say the best of the, of the flock will be yours. The best of the sheep, the best of the goats, those are all yours. I'm going to take the ones that are, that are spotted and speckled and, you know, all these, you know, all, have all these other attributes that aren't quite as good, right? I'll take the subpar. That'll be my hire and you get all the rest. So Laban says, okay, you know, fine. Leave me all the best, right? 
And verse 35 says, And he removed that day the he goats that were ring straked and spotted, and all the she goats that were speckled and spotted, and every one that had some white in it, and all the brown among the sheep, and gave them into the hand of his sons. And he set three days' journey betwixt himself and Jacob. And Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. And Jacob took him rods of green poppy. And this is real interesting part of Scripture. And I'm going to be honest with you right now. I don't completely like, like understand all of this, if there's a science behind this or not. But we're going to read it, and I'll just give you my take on it. There's, there's a couple ways you could, you could look at this story and try to understand it, what he's doing here. But um, what he does here with the, the pilled rods that he puts before the, the cattle, you know, to try to get them to conceive at different times. But we're, we'll read through this because first he, he separates, you know, his hire, the, he separates the cattle from Laban's. And then as he's still feeding them, what he does here in verse 37 says, And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and pilled white strakes in them and made the white to appear, white appear, which was in the rod. So somehow he's kind of like, like, like peeling them or like, like cutting them open a little bit so that the white that's in them starts to appear. And then verse 38 says, And he set the rods which he had pilled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink, that they should conceive when they came to drink. So when they come up to get a drink, he puts the rods in there because that's the time when he wants them to conceive. And it says in verse 39, the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring straked, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring straked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not unto Laban's cattle. And it came to pass, whensoever the, younger, the stronger cattle did conceive that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's, and the stronger Jacob's. And the man increased exceedingly, and had much cattle, and maidservants, and men servants and camels, and asses. So we see here he's doing this thing with these rods. Right Now, one way to look at it is to say, okay, well, he might have picked this up because he's been doing this work for a long time anyways. He might have figured this out somehow that when he puts these rods in, you know, it has this type of a result and they're going to produce these speckled and spotted and, and there may be some kind of science behind it, between, you know, behind it. I don't know if that's true or not. But another way of looking at it is that maybe he just thought that this was going to work and that's why he was doing it. But God was blessing him anyways. And we, we do know for sure that God was blessing him because in the next chapter, we'll just read this real quick and then, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. But in, um, in chapter 31, in verse number 7, the Bible reads, And your father hath deceived me. He's talking to his wives. Your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God suffered him not to hurt me. Hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring straked shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring straked. Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. And it came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived that I lifted up mine eyes and saw in a dream. So here we see he's, he's admitting here that he had this vision, he had this dream. It says, And behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring straked, speckled, and grizzled. And this is exactly what he asked for then of Laban later. He's, he's, he's relaying this dream that he had. In verse 11, it says, And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob. And I said, Here am I. And he said, Lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straked, speckled, and and grizzled, for I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. So he's given this, this dream, this vision, to help him out. To say, you know, that's when he saw this was happening, you know, the angel of God said, Look, we saw that Laban's been cheating you. We see that he hasn't been paying you right. So here you go. Here's a, here's a little insider information, right? So when he asked for his wages, he knew in advance that this is what was going to be produced. Now, did the rods really have much of an impact on that? I don't know. We know he already knew that he, which one to choose, that he should have chosen what he did choose so that he can get that most so God can bless him with, with that much higher, right? But um, 
So I, I can't say for sure if the rods really had an impact or not, but we know for sure that God let him know what, what he was, what he was going to be blessed with. And um, he definitely was, was using that to his advantage, of course, to, to get his proper pay that was, was owed to him for all of the years of labor that he did for Laban. But um, that's all I wanted to get into for chapter 31. We'll get into that, obviously, next week. But um, let's, you know, we need to remember from this chapter, what we see here a lot dealt with is just the envy, right? The strife and the, and the, and the fighting. We need to be able to, to, to not have envy in our life to get past that and um, be a hard worker, be content with the things that you have. Let God make things right for you. You know, you just make sure you're doing the right thing. You're working hard. Let God look on the things that you're doing and let God bless you. Some, it may take a while. Laban or, uh, Jacob worked for many, many years, right? But then finally he gets this blessing. And it, and it works out for him. And it pays out. And we may have to go through hard times and struggles and trials, but let's keep our heads up. Let's, let's work through it and just work as hard as we can and let God bless us for the work that we do. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great stories in the book of Genesis, dear Lord. Help us to learn from them. Help us to, to be able to not fall into the same traps that... that we see many people falling into, dear God. Help us to learn from other people's examples and not to always have to learn from our own mistakes, dear Lord. I pray that you would please give us a heart of contentment. We'll have so much more joy and happiness in our life if we can learn how to be content, just to, to be satisfied with what you have given to us instead of focusing on what you have not given unto us, dear Lord. When we focus on those things, it only leads to problems and to fighting and strife and bitterness, dear Lord. And, and that is just going to make our life miserable. Lord, help us to have the right attitude. Help us to be hard workers, dear God, and not only to be a hard worker in front of the boss, but to be hard worker all the time in front of you as if you were our boss, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.